Well, welcome back to the class. Uh, I'm going to start the class a bit differently today uh, and call out the roster of the students who are registered in this class. Normally, I do it only once at the start of the class, maybe the second lecture of the beginning of the semester. But this time, I'm doing it the second time, about in the middle of the semester, that's now, because a number of students uh, have registered since my first lecture, and um, I don't get any official notification separately that such and such student has registered in the class. Uh, I wish I did, but uh, short of that, I think I'll just call out the role of the names of the students in the class so that uh, if, you're, if I call out your name, that means you're on the roster uh, and uh, you'll be graded uh, provided you, of course, give the exam. Okay, and if your name is not on the roster, which I doubt very much, it will be there, very likely it will be. If it is not, then contact the registrar's office. You don't have to be in touch with me. He is the one or that office that handles your registration in the various courses that you take, okay? So let us start with the, the roster, that roster meaning to call out the names. And let me begin by saying that uh, since these are foreign names for me, uh, like my name is foreign for some people. It's Christian Malik people. So what, what does it mean? I don't know. I, I can pronounce it. Well, that's, I can understand that. Similarly, some of the names that I'm going to pronounce from the roster are foreign to me, alien names, alien in the sense that I'll struggle to come up with the closest pronunciations of those names. Uh, I may succeed or I hope I do. Maybe occasionally I may make an error. I hope you'll understand that I'm trying. Uh, to be as close as uh, the pronunciation of your name, okay? And uh, sometimes I might even spell it out in case I think that it, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but that doesn't happen. I might have to do it once or twice. And let's get started. In this class, there are four, oh no, rather, take it back. There are three sections of this, uh, of this class. And um, one is PGE 383. Uh, PGE 371 and EER 396. So uh, I'm going to start with the roll call of the names that I have in front of me for PGE 383. And uh, there are, I believe, 14 students who have registered in this class, 1414. So let me start with the first name is Mr. Abdul Hadi Al Bukhari, followed by Osama Al Nasri. Okay, let's try the third one. It's going to make a little effort on my part. Orda Mola, Ami Fori. I'll try again. Orda Mola, Ami Fori. I hope I got it right. Uh, then we go forward with Domenico Mari Crisafuli. Chris, Crisafuli. Domenico Crisafuli. Then there is the next one called Dira Bhadra. Oh no, Vira Bhadra Dandulari or Danduluri. Forgive me. I'm trying desperately to make it as close as possible. Vira Bhadra uh, Benduluri. Followed by Ram Disabar. Ram Disabar. And then we have a Christian Dominicus. Godoy, Christian Dominguez Godoy. And we have a young man named Marco Girola, Duncan Morgan, and then there's a tri fam, maybe tree fam, T as in table, R I, fam as P H A M. And there's Achil, A K H I L, Portla, P with in Peter, Portla. And then we have a, a Oriyomi Nurdin. Rahim, R-A-H-E-E-M. And then we have a Sayyid Talha Tirmizi. Tirmizi is T as in table, I-R-M-I-Z-E, Tirmizi. And lastly, out of the list of 14 in this section is uh, Yuzu Zhao. Uh, Zhao is Z-H-A-O. Yuzu is Y-U-Z-H-O-U. And then the last name is Zhao, Z-H-A-O, okay? So here we have 14 names, section 
PD383. And if I've called your name, that you means that you're on the roster of the registrar's office. Because this is the list that I will get at the end of the semester and to post your grade. So it's important that we have you listed here. Otherwise, there would be, there would be no grade coming to you. To you. Now we have uh, the next section is PGE 371, 371. And in this, there are only 10 students. Starting with Laiba Akmal with the A K M A L, Jerem Atluri, J A I R A M Atluri, A T L U R I, James Brady, Jeremy Gordon, Kathleen Isabel Lai, L A I Lai, L A I. Yajing Lan, L A N. Let me no, first read it myself, though I don't make a mistake. Is Andrew Leindecker. Let me spell Leindecker. Is L E Y E N Decker, D E C K E R. It's one word, Leindecker, followed by Ogo Chuku of is Ogo Chuku. The last name is of is O as in Oliver F. France, O Oliver E. Edward, Z Zebra, and E. Edward again. And we have a Ben Stubbs. And finally, there's a David Talbot that makes a list of 10 in this section. And if I've called your name, you're in good shape. Don't worry too much about it. Finally, the third section is EER 396. Only three students. First one is Hannah Bachi, B as in boy, A C H I. Next one is, let me see, Pata, Patarapur Kongdi. K H O N G D I Kong D K H O N G D I and finally Morgan Omodu O M O D U. Okay, that's only three. So if we add up the three sections that I've done, there should be a total of 27 students registered in this class. Now, only for those who are listed as E E R and and, and those who are not, just to let you know that the EER section gives you a special consideration to fulfill the outside the department course requirement for graduation. So you don't have to run around the campus looking for a course that meets the requirement. So if you go to Dr. Def Safanuri, for example, your graduate advisor and say, Dr. Safanuri, and this, I want to take EER 396, Energy Finance. Will it fulfill the requirement that this course will be counted towards my outside the department course requirement? They very likely he'll say yes, okay? Just talk to him, don't take my word. He's the man who finally signs off that you are graduated and fulfilled all the university requirements for graduation, okay? Ultimately, he is the one whose signatures will get you through the university and get your credentials approved and you'll receive the degree, okay? That's for students who are 396, that fulfills an interesting requirement. I thought I'd let you know because some students may not know what is this EER business here, okay? That's, uh, okay. That's a separate little section in the geology department called Energy and Earth Resources. And before we had it in the PGE department and I was the director, but that was 20 years ago. And there's another gentleman there who leads that department. Okay, so that fulfills my, my requirement to call out your names before I start the lecture for today. Uh, as a reminder, we are still on the first part of the course on energy section. The first part being what is investigate, look into the sources of capital, money. Capital is just a fancy word for money. We need many aspects before 
we run, uh, we, we take on the project, you have to be technically sound, you've got to be economically sound, the geology, geology has to be good, you could have the good logging, drilling, and all the good stuff. And uh, of course, you cannot undertake the project unless you have capital money to drill the well, as an example, okay? So therefore, I spent at least half the semester, uh, including today and next time also, on talking about the sources of capital, like, gave you an idea what is the difference between a common and a preferred stock. What's a secure loan and unsecured loan? Remember all those things that we have covered? These are all different ways to raise capital. Another one that we are going to talk today, I suppose it'll take us about 45 minutes on this particular source of capital, is bonds, B as in boy, O and D, bond, or if it's multiple, it's bonds. So let's write it down, okay? Uh, and what is a bond? Very easy. I'm going to touch on many aspects of this topic. So take it easy. Let's first define what do we mean by bonds in the financial terminology. I know when I talk about bonds, the first thing people, the young men, the young women, they laugh, aha, you know, James Bond. No, no. That's another story about James Bond. But here we're talking about financial terms. What does it mean when we say bond in a in a context of finance? Okay. Let me write down the word bonds and the two, three other things with it so that I don't have to get up back and forth and save time. I just, and then you can write that yourself. Okay, let's do the word bond. Let me share with you what happened with me yesterday when I recorded this long lecture for over two hours on, on uh, the lecture that I'm going to give you today. This is a repeat from yesterday. And it's not an exciting experience when you talk to the screen for two hours looking at yourself, but it has to be done. So I do it, okay, um, with the fullest of enthusiasm. And uh, what happened was after I spoke and spoke and spoke and spoke, lectured and lectured for two hours or more maybe on the, the subject that I'm going to lecture now again, the second time, what I discovered to my horror was nothing that was I was talking about for two hours was being recorded. Can you imagine the, <laughs> the frustration that I must have felt? Heaven's sake, I'm just lecturing and lecturing and getting tired and but then I find that whatever I said has not been recorded. So now I'm going to repeat the same lecture that not got, did not get recorded yesterday and I'm doing it again, okay? That's today. Now having said that, uh, now let's talk about bond. What is a bond? Let me write another fancy word that I should have written before. Um, uh, let me see. I'm so afraid of again making some mistake and calling out the two-hour lecture again today and then finding out I'm not being recorded. So let me check. Give me a second. You just stay there. Give me a second.
Very simple. Give me just a second. Can't turn the bad. Okay, sorry. Uh, you can see why I did it. And if you don't, I'll tell you. From yesterday's experience, I'm so scared now that uh, again, if the same thing happens that it's not being recorded, uh, I'll go jump in the lake. If it is. So I'm so scared that I hope that it is being recorded and uh, I've been confirmed. Yes, so I feel relaxed now. Okay. Now I put on the word, uh, where's the word here? Promissory note in black. Eh? Promissory note. So let's go back to the word bonds. What is a bond? It's simple like this, so simple. There are, remember there's a company that you buy the shares from, they issue you the shares, okay? Then you become a shareholder after you give, give them the price of the share, right? Same thing, there's the one, only one difference there. The company that is selling the bond, they generally sell by big company like Exxon, okay? They will say, okay, you want to buy our bond, like the No, the difference is that they'll say, give us some, lend, lend us your money. They make a promise to you. Exxon will make a promise to you that we are selling a $100 bond, $100 price says $100 today. They're making a promise. This is lending to Exxon. So you're a lender to the company Exxon and we will return it to you after 20 or 25 years. And in the meantime, for all this period of time, we'll give you an interest rate. That's all, that's a bond. So, that's, so basically bond, whereas when you buy the shares of a company, you're a shareholder. If you buy the bond of a company, you're a lender. There's a big difference. I'll explain to you slowly what's the difference, okay? So they will, but the thing to remember is a bond is a long-term promise. That's important. You can't just buy the, you can, it's a long-term promise that Exxon will sell, give you back your money after 20 years. But in the meantime, you will be receiving interest. Okay. Slowly, many things that are in your mind will become clear. I know what are you thinking at this time, okay? But if you want to be fancy, fancy, and talk like a banker, I've explained to you in a sample language, they will say what? A bond is a promissory note given by the issuer, Exxon, to the bondholder, whoever is buying the bond. So all I just said was bond is a promise issued by promise made by the issuer Exxon to you who's going the bond. But if you want to sound, imp sound impressive, just say bond is a promissory note. Note means that you've written it on a, on, uh, well, it's, an, it's a written document, so what? So I've taken over the promissory note just so you're not confused, but if you want to impress people, then use the word promissory. My, I'm not here to impress anybody. So it's basically simply that you're lending the money Hundred dollar, you're you're lending to Exxon. Like, and if you buy that bond, let's say one bond of Exxon of hundred dollar. Now you are a lender of hundred dollar. Shareholder, you are the owner of the company. There's a big difference. Why, when you buy the bond, you're called a bond bondholder, of course. But the difference is that you have no say in how the company is being run. Whereas in a share, what happens? There is an annual shareholder meeting. You are the owner. You can meet and remove the chairman of the company and do develop a policy of the company. Whatever, you, it's yours, you're the owner. Bondholder, you're not the owner, you're just the lender. So there's a bondholder meeting every year. As long as you're getting your interest payment on time, you just sit back and relax and get your money every six months or three months or often. They give you the interest. It's all laid out in the prospectus. So whatever I'm going to tell you is in the bond, 
uh, 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 it's kind of an agreement between you who hold the bond and Exxon, the issuer, the seller of the bond. And that agreement has to be approved by the Securities and Exchange Commission, just like the shares. So you prepare a prospectus, defining all the terms of the bond. You go to the SEC like the share for a public company. They look at it, they approve it. Then you can go to the stock market and start selling like the shares if you sell. But in that prospectus, you laid on all the conditions and the terms, and we're going to talk some of them as we go now. So that agreement between you who bought the bond of Exxon and Exxon who sold the bond to you, there has to be some agreement between you and two, okay? And that agreement is called indenture. Let me spell it, indenture. I, N as in Nancy, D as in David, E, Edward, N, Nancy, T as in table, U, umbrella, R, Robert, R, Edward. Okay. Indenture, I, N, starting with that, is the agreement between you, the who's buying the bond, and the company that is issuing the bond. Exxon in this case. We'll use Exxon only as an example. Okay. So that now you have an idea of what is it? Bond. Every bond has a face value. There's no bond without a face value. The value $100 on the bond will be inscribed on the bond that $100 they will, Exxon will give you, but after 25 years, $100, it's laid down. And that is called the par value. I think I've written the word par value. Is also called the face value of the bond, okay? And on the, and the prospector, you'll say, well, if you give me your money, you're my banker, I, you're my, I will give you an interest on that of 10% for the next 10 years. It's fixed. So every year, if it's an annual payment, and you buy a thousand dollar worth of bonds, so you'll get what? For 10% of a thousand dollars, hundred dollar. So you'll get an interest of hundred dollar for 25 years. The interest rate of 10% is called the bond rate. I've written the word bond rate. I, oh, by the way, I forgot. I, I've written the word bond indenture also. You notice that? Yeah, I forgot. I'd already written that. And I want to remind you, unlike shareholders, they can interfere with the company because that's their company. They're the owners. The bondholders cannot interfere as long as they're getting paid. The question comes up. Uh, how are they paid? Okay, how are they paid, the bondholders? For 25 years, how are you gonna? There are different ways, these are logical questions. There are different ways how the bondholder is getting paid, the interest, of course. You have, may have, um, like the dividend, and the company will have maybe a, your address, and every six months, if it's a 10% interest on a, on a $100 bond, and on a, let's say make it sound like $1,000, okay? If it is a $1,000 worth of bond you bought, and 10% is $100. So, and they say, well, we'll give you interest every six months. That means what? Every six months, you'll get in the mail $50. 10% of is $100 of $1,000, but in six months it'll be $50, that's all. Or that's one way you get in the mail, like you get dividends. It's dividends, profit sharing of the company if you make a profit. Now there's another way that you can get paid the, the $50 every six months. In that case, when you buy the bond worth 
$1,000, you may get a little booklet like this thick, little booklet of coupons. You know coupon? Like you go to HEB, the coupon sometimes you use to get cheap groceries. So the coupon will say, one coupon say, January 1, 2020, $50 written on the top. And on the back side would be a list of banks in your area. And if you buy that bond with a coupon, little booklet with 100 coupons maybe, and you, all you have to do is on January the 1st, 2020 or after, you can go to the bank and the back side of the coupon and give them the coupon, it'll say $50 to be given to you in cash. So if they take the coupon, you get $50. They call coupon bonds, simple. That's another way. There's a third way. Or a another kind of a bond, not third. And they're called zero, zero, Z-E-R-O, zero coupon bond. Zero coupon bond, strange, man. The zero coupon bond, simple definition is bond with what? Zero coupon. What can I say? No coupons. So you don't get paid the interest. You say, what? Who in the world is going to buy a zero coupon bond and not get an interest? Why would it do it? That's one question. The second question is, when will he get the interest? Will he ever get it? Yes. When? These are two logical questions you should have. I've already planted them in your mind. When will they get the interest and that's one. Not for 20 years. If, if it's a 20 year bond, you will not see any interest for 20 years. When will they get it? In a zero coupon bond, you do not get the interest. So what happens is every six months that you're going to get, supposedly it's supposed to get $50 in the last example, the company, you automatically, in the prospectus, you automatically are lending this $50 back to the company, back to the company, the compounding. But you're not getting it in cash now, but you're getting giving it back to the company. So what is happening is, after 20 years, all the interest that you are not getting, you will get them accrued for 20 years and you will be a very happy person after 20 years because now the company has to pay you so much that they have not paid you for 20 years. So you can throw a big party and invite me to that. I'll be happy to join you. But during the 20 years, you don't, getting interest. I hope that is clear. No coupon. Now your question is, what is the benefit of one with a coupon bond and the other no coupon bond? All these are called financial products. Let me first explain what's the difference. Why would one buy a coupon bond, somebody buy a zero coupon bond, and then I'll go and they'll little summary of what you've been learning for you know, two sentences for the last semester, during the semester. I, for example, I will not buy a zero coupon bond. Somebody who's, that's a 30 year old and is married and has a child would, tend to or may end up buying a zero coupon bond. Why will I not buy it and he might or she might? Very simple. The bond is long term. After 25 years, I'll get a lot of money. Are you going to tell me I'm going to live another 25 years? At my age, I'm lucky if I live another five years or three years or two years. So why in the world would I want a zero coupon bond. There's no way in the world that I'm going to be here in 25 years. 
So I'll buy a bond which has coupon. Why would I buy it? I was, because to supplement my retirement income. You know, pension that when you retire, you get some money from the federal government, some through social security and some from the company. So what I need is maybe get regular income to add to my the income social security I'm getting from the government so I can make a decent living. So that regular income is, has an appeal to me, but the zero coupon bond has no appeal to me. So I want a coupon bond, a bond that sends me dividend every six months. However, if there's a person who's 50, 30 year old, if he's smart, this is what he can do. He's a child, yeah. When a child is born, as an example, he or she buys a zero coupon bond. Saying what? Well, this child is going to be bright a child and finally one day he's going to do very well in high school and we're going to get him to college and we are need tuition for this university. They're getting expensive and expensive and expensive. Guess what? He said, well, at that time, in 20 years, when I, my child is going to college, I better have some money for the tuition for the child. So he wants a zero coupon bond that the money that he should be getting an in interest now on, on the bond rate will, after 20 years, add up to so much that now he can pay the tuition fee for the child. So he's, he's okay with the zero coupon bond. He's planning. not to disappoint you on what I've been through, is this what you always hear about grandfathers, great grandfathers talk about. Oh, when I was young, you know, this thing cost 50 cents. Now the same thing I remember now cost $5. When I was young, they always talk about when I was young. I know. So I'm gonna tell you when I was young, that was 500 years ago, I used to be young. By looking at me now, you cannot be, I was young. I know you can't believe it. I had hair that were black and a good crop of, what do you, do you see any hair here? Well, there's seven hair here and I take the comb and move it around so that they look like seven, maybe nine hair. So what's the point? When I do, you know, I already had a master's in geology when I came to the University of Texas, 1971, summer of 1971. Landed in Austin, May 24th, 1971. Some of you have dads that are much younger than that. That's 51 years ago. You know, I was paying resident fee because I had a research fellowship. You know, my resident fee was at the University of Texas. $200 only for the semester, $200. Now our daughter went to school, they're great, about 10 years back, they, over here UT, everybody in my family is UT, everybody, my daughter, my wife, my son-in-law, everybody. We don't let anybody in the house unless they have a UT degree and they can show they have it. I'm telling you, my daughter, my wife, my son-in-law, everybody, UT, 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 UT. The door is locked for non-UT. No, I don't, I'm joking, don't. If there's a non-UT guy, don't worry about it, I'm joking, okay? But that's, that's a fact also. However, there's one, you know, uh, Sandow is a medical doctor, but that the uh, UT didn't have a medical school, so he had to go somewhere else. So anyway, take it as a joke. There might be somebody from A&M, so what do you think, you know, who you, I don't know, I have to be careful, everything is being recorded. Oh yeah, Dr. Malik only talks about UT, so okay. At least your UT, this semester, at least I know that. Now, uh, the fee, I think, is some, depending on how many course hours do you take, is between five, res, this resident, this in state fee, in state, between five and six thousand dollars, I think. I don't know what you paid, I have no idea. I paid 200. So, the, so that gentleman in that example, he's going to put his child to the University of Texas. That's a, a good deal. And this is the best deal in town. The other universities are multiple of 10,000, but I don't even think of going there. So that's the point. He's preparing child's education. He's bought a zero coupon bond. People always talk, oh, my son went to Harvard and MIT and Stanford. 
Oh, the, oh my friend, Caltech, uh, Berkeley. Oh, oh, yes, sir, and Rice, and I've heard it. To me, frankly speaking, it does not, does not, does not, does not matter where your child went to school, Harvard or Yale. I don't care all the money. Thank God one, went, one of them went to Yale. That's the only one who didn't go here because that you did because there was no medical school here. What matters is not the name of the school. Please carry my word to other people who get carried impressed by any of these big names. And we are just in the top universities in the United States. What matters is the teacher, the professor who is teaching that particular subject. He could be from any odd university uh, outside of Austin. Or St. Edward is not ranked up top in the world, right? If the professor of chemistry in St. Edward is, is really, really good, he beats anybody at Harvard or MIT or Yale. So they always, oh, my son, oh, no. okay, yeah, and we know you paid a lot of money to send your son or daughter to the university. Why? I don't know. I should know better. I've got both my daughters went to school here and did very well in life, thank God. By the way, if you're an EER student, they both would got a degree in EER. Yeah, they were petroleum engineering. That's part of petroleum engineering. Okay. Never mind. That is a side thing, you know. Now, you know how we get paid the, the interest, the two ways, three ways. Let me put another idea in your mind. I did say that Exxon borrowed $500 million by selling the bonds. Today, they sold $500 million of bonds. A lot of, mucho dinero, lots of money. Look at my Spanish getting better every day. Mucho dinero, those are the two words I know. Spanish, boy, I'm good at Spanish. <laughs> don't ask me for the third one. I don't know what it is. Gracias, I guess. Now what happens? The chairman Exxon today borrowed $500 million from you and everybody else, and you gave him the, and he sold you the bonds, remember? He's long gone, he's chairman, he's gone, he retired, and he probably died in the meantime in 25 years. You're not going to dig up his grave and say, okay, you know, after 25 years, hey man, give me my money. There's a new chairman there in 25 years of Exxon. And today is 25 years when Exxon is obliged under the prospectus to return the $500 million to the bondholders. I hope you're getting my message. The new chairman has to come up with that money. The old guy is dead. The question now is, uh, where did the new chairman get the money to pay back the old guy's $500 million debt? that he accrued on Exxon. Let's talk about, give me, give, let me give you another word now, and then I'll talk about how does he do it, the new guy, with the new chairman. When the money, that $500 million that was borrowed is returned to the bondholder after 25 years, one day they have to return them, that is called the bond is, has been retired. So write it down. After 25 years, when the new chairman, or the chairman at that time, has returned that borrowed money of $500 million to the bondholder because it's part of the prospectus, the date is laid down, even the date is there and the year, that is called the bond has been retired. Or another word is redeemed. Let me spell it to you. Redeemed. R E T as in David, E E M as in Mary, E T as in David. Redeemed. R E D as in David, double E M as in Mary, E D D as in David again. You can use the word redeemed or you can use the word retired. So where were we? We were at the point where how is the money 
five, where is the money, $500 million going to come up with the two to, after 25 years for the chairman to give back to the bondholder because it's part of the prospectus. We're going to talk about three different ways that, that person, the chairman's seat of Exxon at that, is going to pay back the money. Where is he going to get the $500 million from? So three ways. One is, when the time comes, the chairman at that time, 25 years from today, can issue new bonds. Wow. He can issue new bonds for $500 million for another 20 years, maybe, and what we call pass the bug. Let the next guy after 20 years as chairman, let him worry about it. This guy got his $500 million. He's prepared, to, he's paid back the old bondholders. Now he's moved a new series of bonds for the next guy to worry about. But <laughs> there's a problem with that. After 25 years, he goes to the marketplace to sell his bond to you and everybody else. The first thing is to inquire whoever is going to buy. How is the company doing now? Forget what happened 25 years ago. Tell us if I bond after 25, the day of 25th year, the new bondholders, you know, is going to look at the company starting again. If the company is doing well, they will buy the bonds again for the next 20 years. Where it's doing badly, they're not going to buy. So here you've got a problem. You have to do show that you're doing well, otherwise you will never not succeed. It's, it's a simple question of are you doing well or not well? That's after 25 years. That's one way you can show new bond, provided you're doing well. But there's another way. Remember the fellow the chairman who, now, who sold the bond for $500 million value, and if he was smart and responsible chairman, what did he do? What should he have done for 25 years, you know, to be paid? He should, if he's smart, that's what I would do. From the revenue coming to Exxon for the next 25 years, you know, the revenue stream coming every month, every year, he would put aside in a savings account, a little bit of the revenue that will add up to, to $500 million in 25 years. In a savings account that in 25 years, that little amount added, 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 added with the interest would hopefully would have an amount of $500 million. That would be a smart thing to do. So the new chairman then, okay, here we are, $500 million, already there in the account, in a savings account of Exxon. Or, you want to sound fancy? It's also, savings account is the easy one. Everybody understands savings account. The savings account sometimes is called the sinking fund. Sink, like a sink, sank, sunk. Sinking fund, just another name for savings account. So in other words, you can have a, chairman now can have a sinking fund, $500 million, or accruing, adding up to, accruing mint, adding up to. So that's one way. The advantage of that is that if I feel like the company is already preparing now a little bit, little bit, little bit to pay with me back or whoever is holding the bond after 25 years. So I develop some confidence that these guys are serious about paying me back after 25 years. Okay. Now the third way, and I'll come back to this theme again about the seriousness of the company is com coming under the question will be risk. Bonds carry a lot of risk for 25 years. That we'll talk about maybe towards the end, which is coming fairly soon. But I'm still on the subject of how is the new chairman going to raise $500 million to 
pay back the old bond holders today, today that 25 years is a few. One is to issue new bonds. The other one is have a sinking of fund saving. And the third one, to in the prospectus, remember the prospectus today that you're going to issue to get the bond sold today, you have to go to the SEC, da, 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 the whole thing. You can put down that the, these bonds, if you buy them today, the for 25, are convertible bonds. Convert, you know, it's convertible. Convert. Convertible bonds. Let me write it. Convertible bonds convert from what to what? You can write, or remember, it's a part of the prospectus. Day one, when you're selling the, the first series of bonds today, you can write down in the prospectus that if you buy the bond today, you buy 100 bonds today, $100 bond, buy 1,000 of them, let's say. You have the right, you don't have to, but you have the permission that in the next five years, if only if you want to, it's your discretion, your option, if you want to convert the bond that you hold, that whatever I said, what a thousand bonds, a hundred, whatever the number was, to into your shares of the company, you may do so, convert them. If you want to what? In the next few years, you, you cite five years, seven years, three years. If you convert your bonds in Exxon to become a shareholder of Exxon, then they may put in for every one, one bond, you can convert it to one share or whatever ratio, you will be allowed to do so during that period of time. So if you exercise that option, so now you're no more a bondholder, you're a shareholder. You do not have the new chairman after 500 years or <laughs> 25 years will not have to worry about raising the money of $500 million because now he doesn't have to give it back. Now the bondholder has become a shareholder. That's the owner. If the company, well, it's an option. You don't have to if you're a bondholder, convert. Or at least if I were there, I said, well, this company looks like it's doing very well. Let me convert my shares into bonds. I might do that. Or if it's doing badly, I say, hey, let it go, man. I'm, it's not doing very well. Let's keep the bonds. Again, the 25 years bond doesn't mean that you're stuck with it for 25 years. Same as in shares. When you buy shares, are you stuck with the shares forever? Of course not. You can get in the computer today and sell all your shares or two shares or 10 shares or whatever company you bought them in. Same thing with bonds. That you can go to the Securities and Exchange Commission, get the approval, go to the stock market, New York stock market, the list of bonds. You say, I want to sell my bonds. Uh, uh, no, what would them call it? XYZ bonds. Uh, at an interest rate, what if the interest, let's say the bond has an interest rate of 10%. That means if somebody buys those bonds for today, which were issued in the, in the past, and the interest is 10%, that person will get, and he buys your bond from me to the stock market, he'll get interest. Rate. But if he goes to the bank today, the interest is 3%. So what are you going to do? 
he's going to go to the market and buy the bond because they, the bonds are going to get 10% interest. That means the value of the bond that was purchased some time back is going to go up because the, value, the inter, bond rate is much higher than the prevailing interest rate of the value of the bond is so basic. Sometimes I overkill in my explanation. Maybe, and I say, my goodness, man, they're graduate students. Why do I have to worry about it? No, but still, I'd like to do it that way so there are no questions. And, 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 and interesting, they have not had any questions um, during this period of time because I, I go overboard in explaining, okay? I like it to do it that way. So, 20, 25 year period is a long time promise. Lots of risk in that. So now we are talking about risk management or risk. How do you, in all businesses, there's not a business in the world that does not have risk. Some have more, some have less. Which brings up the question of bond rating. Rating of bonds. Is it a good bond? Which will the company exist after 25 years? Is it a that be good money? Is the company is low risk? Or is it a fly-by-night company? It may disappear after two years. To, the bond is with them is 25. Then what good is it? I can cite at least two, maybe even three, bond rating companies. They're called bond rating agencies companies. They're well known around the globe. Very famous. I'll write down the name. And then we'll talk about the scale, how they rate the bonds. Let me write down the names first of these companies. Very, very common name in the financial, financial, financial world. Here are three names, particularly the top two are very common. And we use a lot of those two companies in the, in the United States. You can subscribe to them. Okay? It's called Standard and Poor's, but generally the acronym, we generally call, refer to them as S and P. They just look at the company and the past and the present, what the thing is in the future, and they come up with an assessment. Okay. Are they always right? No. Can they be right? Can they be wrong? Yeah, who knows? They're, 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 they're judgment call. They're, they're, they're judging. 
you don't have to ask them. You can judge it yourself. What do you think is Exxon? Is it's going to go up, go down? Yeah. The other one that is well known is Moody's Investors Service. Nobody talks about Moody's Investors Service. They just say Moody's, but the real name is the whole thing. Followed by which Fitch rating, not that common. Fitch, I've spelled it. That's called Fitch. So here we have three companies, particularly the top two. They'll you tell ask them and whatever they charge, I don't want to charge. And what do you think about Exxon? Do you think it'll be around here after 25? They'll tell you. Don't bank that it's going to be right or wrong. They're just we're just relying on the judgment. The ju they have a scale on which they judge. If you ask me. What does it mean, bond rating? It is simply one sentence. The likelihood, the chance, likelihood means the chance that the bond that you bought will never get the money back. The risk, the chance of the risk, the risk of not being able to get your money back during the 25 year period. It's risk analysis. So there's a scale to triple A, double A, A, triple B, double B, and so on. And I'm gonna write it down. This is how the scale goes. Bond rating. The subject is bond. Rating. Hope this can get out of the way.
as you can see, the top high quality, investment grade, continue this side, substandard and speculative or junk bonds. And notice that, and put that line there, between investment grade and substandard, there's a wavy line. There's a reason for that. I think it's obvious to you as you we go from high quality down towards the speculative, the quality of the of the of the of the bond decreases. That means the risk increases, the quality decreases, the risk of you seeing your money on 25 years begins to gradually decrease all the way to speculative. You can call it junk. That means you may or not may not even see the money after 25, whether the company will even exist after 25 years, that's all the way there. And then obviously we'll have to ask the question, why would anybody buy speculative and not buy triple A? The logical question. The next question you can ask me, what is this wavy line between triple B and double B? Simple question that I have the answer for both of them. Let's take up the second question first. The wavy line between triple B and double B. According to government regulations, institutional investors are not allowed to purchase bonds that have a rating of less than, they can purchase bonds with tri triple B or better, but not double B. Anything less than double B, double B is not acceptable. Triple B is acceptable and everything after, or before triple B is triple A now, they're acceptable but not double B and anything after on the right side of double B is not allowed under government regulations. For who? Not for me, strictly for institutional investors. If you ask me what is an institutional investor, the mans my answer is go back and look at my first or second lectures of this, during this class. These are the big time investors like insurance companies. The insurance companies know that they collect revenues and they collect life insurance and they pay annuities and they pay pensions. You know, every month after you retire, they said, we'll give you so much, but you have to give us the money for the next 30 years. So when you retire, we'll give you your money and more after 30 years in installments called pension programs, retirement accounts. They are institutional investors as an example. So they're not allowed to, to deal in these double B companies with that kind of rating. Simple because it's to, if, they, if, they're, if they're working with my retirement, what would happen after I'm turning 65 and they buy a bond on the, which are double B, which is a very poor quality bond and the company disappears after five years, they cannot, that insurance company would know, where can they go to get, get the money to pay me back? That retirement. So the government said, no, 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 don't take that risk. You're playing with the lives of the, of the old people. They are there to protect us, the government. Then the question is, what about the junk bond? Just speculative, you know. Why would anybody buy that? It's very simple. Something basic in investment, and remember it. What is that? Risk reward. Risk reward. The more the risk, the more the reward. The less the risk, the less the reward. It's so basic as ABC. There's no way around it. So what then the question is, speculative uh, uh, or junk bonds are risky, of course. So why would, why? because in order to sell 
the company that has rated junk bond, the companies are rated by S&P, you know, if they rate, if S&P rates that this company is speculative, so I'm not going to buy the bond. Only I will buy them if that company offers me a very good interest. So therefore, to go from the left, high quality to the right, poor and poorest quality, they, they have to make a buy offering. The companies have to make a buy offering a much higher interest rate. And you take the risk, it may not exist, or at least while you're getting it, they're still in existence, you're probably gonna make a good return through the interest payment, which is going to be reasonably higher. Simple common sense. With that, let me complete the story about junk, about, excuse, about bonds, okay? You should be an expert in bonds. So now, you, what have I done? I've given you products. These are called financial products, not bonds, secured bonds. Um, that's what I'm talking about. These are called financial instruments. All this semester, I've been teaching you financial instruments. Call them products. Like Walmart, you go to Walmart, what is it? Got 10,000 products sitting there. Does it? Why? Because well, I may like this product, you may like that product, you need that product, this is more useful to you, this product. So we have a variety. So in Walmart and all these fancy JC pennies and the companies, Target and all this, they have so many products. The same thing in finance, there's so many products. Some people like preferred stock, that suits them. They other like common stock, that suits them. Some like bond, that suits them. Some like high quality bond, that suits them. Some want a secure loan, that suits them. Some unsecured loan, then I can go on and on. Throughout the semester so far, except the first lecture where I gave one changes in all business, that's over. All I've done is teach you about the financial product. These are so also called financial instruments. So if you want to impress people, say, well, what is Dr. Malik teach? Well, I've been learning about financial instruments. Oh boy, really boy, that's good. heavy duty learning. But you got it. End of the story on bonds. Let me continue to a totally different subject. The word is trade credit. Write down the word trade, T-R-A-D-E. Credit, C R E D I T, credit. I could get up and write it, and this this way I can say more, teach you more than I would have spent three minutes getting up, writing it, coming back and starting again. This way. I'm trying to to keep it tight in the sense that you know give you more in the less time that I have because I know you can spell trade yourself and credit, so I'm saving myself from. Uh, right and spending time on just writing everything. Sometimes I feel like maybe I should when they could be confusing in the spelling or something, but trade is just a common word that you all know what it means. What is a trade credit is a question. Very simple, an example will help you. Let us say that um, your company uh, they all, and it's a manufacturing company and there's a buyer of your stuff and there's a, another company that uh, uses that uh, and some, well, one buys and one manufactures, simple as, make it simple. And you, uh, your company says to the manufacturer of, uh, let's pick a, a generator, they manufacture generators. To the generator company, they say, we want 10 generators, please. We, we need them, they're the buyer. And the manufacturer says, okay, we'll ship them to you. After about a week, the 10 generators arrive in your premises in the warehouse. They say, well, put in the warehouse, storage area. So what has happened? They have sent you the generators, you have received the generator, they're physically in your premises at the warehouse. So when this fellow who's delivered the generator comes, is leaving, and you have a manager of the warehouse, your warehouse, he leaves with the manager of the warehouse what is called a, an invoice. Meaning what? Simply says that we have delivered 10 generators, each generator is $1,000, 
So you owe us, the manufacturer, $10,000. That's called an invoice. And then he leaves, hands you the invoice. On the back of the invoice, are terms and conditions under which you will pay. For example, it would say, you don't have to pay this, what did I say, $10,000, $1,000 generator, 10 of them will be 10,000. You don't have to pay $10,000 right now, although you do have in your warehouse the generator. We will give you 30 days, three zero, to pay the money, 30 days. So in 30 days, you have to pay, otherwise we'll start charging interest after 30 days. So what's the point? For 30 days, the manufacturer has extended, has given a loan of $10,000 without interest to the user of the generator, who ordered the generator. No, no interest for 30 days. Credit with loan, that means the manufacturer has given a loan for 30 days free of interest. That is called a trade credit from the manufacturer to the buyer of the generators. Big companies have annual purchases of maybe a few hundred million dollars every year. So in every time when there are deliveries of 30 days credit loan, no interest, can you imagine for hundreds of million dollars over the period of what? One year, how much interest the company buying this in, uh, the, the product would have saved? An enormous amount. You get it? Okay. So that is what is called the trade credit, T-R-A-D-E credit. Having said that, I'm now tempted to see, well, I've been on and on and on and on and on and on talking to myself and <laughs> looking at the screen, I'm talking to myself, whereas you come up, walk around, you have a cup of coffee and I'm not drinking any coffee here. And after 20 minutes, you go call up your girlfriend maybe, or call your mama or your whatever, your boyfriend. And I don't have that luxury. Or you put in a pause, I said, well, let's keep going and on and on. So this time I'm at the point where the, it's a monologue, you know, monologue. Thinking what your question might be, asking a question, since you're not here, this is what you might be thinking, this is what you may be asking. And the, the effort is multiplied many times. I'm still debating whether I should take a break now or continue. You know, sometimes you say, oh, take a break, sometimes you continue. Sometimes when I am in person teaching the course, I, I negotiate, I may have told you that. And I say, well, folks, you decide, would you rather take a break 15, 20 minutes and come back and I'll continue or not take a break and I'll come continue anyway. The invariable say, don't take a break. They don't worry about me going nonstop. And in that case, I said, well, if I don't, and you don't take a break, 20 minutes, 15, 10 minutes in person, then we'll go, I'll let you off early 10, 15, 20 minutes. So they, oh, that's a great idea. So that's what they always opt for, but that's okay. So I might do the something like that. I think I'll rather continue now, as exhausted as I am. All right. At least, uh, uh, no, might as well. The next subject is a long one. It's called leasing, renting. Okay. Let me write down the word leasing or renting.
Leasing is another word for renting. You can use one word or another, leasing, rent, same thing. You can lease a car or you can rent a car. You can lease a house, apartment, or you can rent an apartment. <clears throat> Whenever the subject leasing comes up, there are two words that you have to be familiar with. The words are on the board. One is called lessor with the O-R. The lessee with the double E at the end, you notice that? Let's be clear about what do they mean. <clears throat> the word lessor means the owner of the house that you're renting, the apartment. He's the lessor, the owner. If you're renting from him, you're the lessee, he's the renter. Keep that in mind. Lessor and lessee. For any business to happen, it's obvious, both sides have to benefit. So in same, similarly here, in case of leasing, the lessor, the owner has to benefit, and the lessee, the renter has to benefit. There are many benefits to the lessor, the owner, when you, for your equipment, so you, that you might rent or lease or many benefits to the lessee. You can rent, lease big items also, huge items. To get you thinking and starting to talk about leasing, let me introduce you to what? You see all these airlines, they fly you around the globe. No all these airlines, American Airlines, United, Delta, Air France, KLM, and on and on, Alitalia, Air France. 
Pan Am. Pan Am doesn't exist anymore. That was my favorite airline. Just to give you a little light of it. You may have read about a, a, a big jumbo jet there at 747 that came down from the sky. Just over Lockerbie is a place in Scotland, Lockerbie. It was, they say it was blasted in the air by some terrorists. We don't know, but it came down. Nobody survived. That was Pan Am's flight. And then Pan Am is bankrupt now. All these airlines that you fly around the world in the aircraft, most of the aircraft of the airlines are leased. They do not belong to Air France or KLM. They are leased from leasing companies. Leasing companies buy the aircraft from Boeing or Airbus. And then they lease it to Air France or whatever, whichever company you want to talk about. But some, of course, the Air France buys, but a large percentage, they just lease it. And there are a few, very few leasing companies in the world that lease aircraft. I know there is one in, in Australia and one in California. They, they just buy the aircraft from Boeing or Airbus. These are the big companies now in the world for manufacturing aircraft, airliners, and they lease it. So what the point being what? You can lease big items. You can lease an Air 380. Yeah, 380, that's a big double-decker all the way. It's now, I think they stopped manufacturing as of December, I think, recently. No, no, not economically worthwhile. So, and we can lease offshore platforms and rigs. So this all business is less focused on what we can now lease in the oil business and rigs. Many of the rigs are leased. At one time, we were drilling over 4,000 oil wells, oil gas wells and dry wells, of course. In the United States, mark my word for it, go look, Google it. In 1981, you'll see that. We did 89,000 oil and gas wells, 89,000 a year. Not all of them, gushers, most of the dry wells anyway. They're not big. They're like 4,000, 3,000, 7,000 feet. And they came drilling like water wells. You think they all were bought by the drillers? They were all by the drilled by the rigs that they own. No, they leased a lot of rigs. Anyway, so the point is you can lease all kinds of good stuff. In the oil business, oil rig comes to mind. The benefits, as I said, the lesser are many, and so is the lesser. If you have an apartment and you lease it, you no, know, you're the owner. So you get regular rental payments from the lessee. So that's a benefit. You get regular income coming from the renter, the lessee. That's regular payments, cash flow. At the end of the lease period, depending on how long the lease is, the equipment has to be given back unless you have special arrangement to the lessor by the lessee. So there's a, and the lessor can, you know, go back and, 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 and sell that equipment or give it to somebody else to lay it, uh, for leasing. And that means what? It has a residual value of the Senate, the remaining value to the lessor. There are some, lots of tax benefits of depreciation to the lessor. I will not go into detail, I can, but I don't think that would be necessary in this class. This right on tax benefits to the lessor through depreciation. D E P as in Peter R E C I A T I O at depreciation allowance. They get a depreciation allowance. Again, I can spend an hour talking about what is depreciation allowance. If you take my other course, the agreements course, which is on Fridays, I go into more details in depreciation allowance. I circle the globe, which country has what kind of depreciation, or why do they give it? What's the benefit? So you can see I've just cited just a few, very few benefits of leasing to the lessor, the owner. Now let's talk about the benefits to the renter or the one who's leasing it, lessee. There are many. Let me give you just a few. One could be, as I explained to you, 
when we talked about loan agreements, remember we, 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 we spent a good amount of time talking about loan agreements between the bank and the borrower. And we talked about covenants. Go back to my class of that. Affirmative covenants. I talked about negative covenants. Remember all that? And covenants are promises. I said that. So what if you just took a loan? He signed off, Mr. Banker. I, you give me this $2 million for whatever you need it for. But I will not borrow any more. You have signed this agreement. It's a covenant. I will not borrow more money. Please give it to me this much now, only now. And never again will I borrow for the next two years. What if suddenly you need something? But you can't borrow to buy that thing. Because you said, I will not borrow any more money. So it did, you didn't say, I will not lease that equipment. So you could go and lease it. You could go around the covenant, we can't you? Of course you can. One benefit. It loosens you from the covenants a little bit. Loan covenants, you can write on loan, L-O-A-N, covenants. You can go around C-O-V-E-N-A-N-T. Let me write it. So these are the benefits to the lessee loan covenant is one. I've just talked about it. Number two, have you written it? Payments can be coordinated with cash flow. Lease payments, monthly, quarterly lease payments, you know, can be coordinated with cash flow. Let's talk about that. Um, when you go to the bank and you say, Mr. Banker, you want the loan? They say, okay, fine, we're going to give you the loan. How are you going to pay, pay us back? Give us a repayment, a repayment schedule. So you, the borrower, and the bank, 
lender, Sedona develop a, a repayment schedule that you'll pay this loan back in five years and every month you'll pay you now this much interest and principal amount, the loan amount slowly comes back to the bank. And in five years, we'll all get all the money back. This is called a loan repayment schedule. Also referred to as loan amortization. Amortization, A-M-O-R. T I Z A T I O N. Same as prepayment, amortization. A M O R T I Z A T I O N. When you, when you talk to the bank, they generally want a, a constant amount to be paid back every month or every three months for five years till the loan is all paid back. Constant. If they say, well, uh, this is the amount like you'll have to pay us $500, but it'll be $500 every month or every three months or so. Is it that the businesses have a constant cash flow throughout the year? No business has a constant cash flow throughout the year. We've been to the mall in Christmas time. I don't know what percentage, probably 80% of the sales of uh, in the malls of uh, in the shopping malls are, uh, take place in, in or around Christmas, between Thanksgiving and Christmas. That's when the cash flow is the highest, the revenue coming to the shops in the mall, Neiman Marcus and uh, Nordstrom, these are fancy stores that where you shop. I go shop in Walmart, I'm a poor guy. These are the shops that they make a lot of money during Christmas. Most of it comes in a little two months around Christmas. Similarly with our big business, I'll give you an example. Electric utility business where I served in the 70s, long ago. Know a little bit about that business. I can bet my last dollar that on August of this year and the next year and the next year and the next year, the electric utilities revenue will be the maximum in the entire year. On August 14, maybe 13, maybe 11, maybe 50. That window. Uh, 11 to 15, the revenue coming to the electric utility will be maximum. I can put my dollar on that as a bet. How can I do that? During April, the revenue of the electric utility in Austin, Texas, which is publicly owned, is, we all own the electric utility, it's public. We are the owners, I am the owner, you are the owner. The revenue in April will be lowest, August will be highest. Common sense. It doesn't take a genius to say that. Why? August 11, 12, 13, 14, that window. I've lived here for 51 years, I know. Austin has the highest humidity, 100% humidity, you can just drain and sweat. And the temperature raising 107 degrees. 10, 107 was 10 is too much. Miserable. So what's going to happen with the weather? It's so bad. Temperature is high. So what are you going to do if you can afford it? You're going to get the air conditioning going 24 hours every minute of the day and night. Or what's going to happen to your bill? To the revenue, to the electric, you're going to be paying a lot of money to the revenue as a revenue for, on the bill, the electricity bill to the company, right? That means August, the, the company, electric company is going to have a lot of revenues. They can make a bigger payment to the leasing company. You know, these payment, the bank doesn't like that. They want a constant. April. 
why did I say the revenue to the electric utility was going to be the lowest? Just reverse the process. We've been in Austin, you know, March, very soon we're going to have your spring break and after that comes April, about that time. Wow, who wants to be inside? You're not going to be inside. I know you're going to hit the beaches. I know you're going to go to the beaches. There'll be flowers, the, the, the temperature will be perfect, and you're going to be having picnic, and you're going to run around, you know, having a great time. Nobody's going to be indoors. The temperature is perfect, the humidity is zero. Boy, it's the best time of the year. So nobody's using air conditioning or heating. Electricity bill is low. So revenues are low. So that's the point. The utility will tell the leasing company, give us the rig, or not the rig, whatever, the generator, car turbine, whatever they want to use. We'll pay you more lease payments during the summer of when that window, June, July, August, but less in the March, April, May, because it's coordination with my with the revenues and revenues here as a function of climate. That's what it says. Payments coordinated with the cash flow. I hope you understand. Simple, you know, big thing I'm sharing a voice, supernatural intellectual capacity. Yeah, this is stuff here. Did I say longer term of lease? Yeah, long term of lease. Or longer is relative. Longer means compared to what? Long term, or you can say longer, doesn't matter. I can explain it either way. To longer term of the lease compared to bank financing. What does that mean? You go to the bank, you borrow the money. I've been a banker, I should know. They prefer that, that you give back the money, the, the repayment, the amortization, and all the loan back, maybe five years, four, five years. It's a big loan, maybe six years. But the leasing company, you can say, well, can I have uh, the equipment for the life of the equipment? You say, 25 years? Bank doesn't go for a 25-year uh, loan. So what's the, what's the point? If you have a bank payment due in five years, your monthly payment to be, give back the loan, plus the interest is going to be very high. Obviously, you could return everything in five years. In leasing case, you can make the lease payment spread. The same thing spread of what? 20 years. And the payment is going to be spread out for and it's going to be low or small. And if you're a businessman, uh, the low payment means you're going to have some money spare to use it in another business. So I'm not saying that every benefit, every advantage applies to everybody, every businessman in every situation. This my business may have this benefit this year, this may have this benefit next year, this may have this and this. But at least I'm opening your mind. That's what I'm trying to do. Of the various options you might have. Leasing is, not, is offsetting the need for capital. What does it do? Sources of capital. You say, well, it's not a source of capital. No, well, it is in a way. What do you need the capital for? To borrow, to you, to buy something, maybe at least uh, to buy a, uh, a rig. But if you, that's borrow. This offsets the need to borrow often remove the need to borrow because now you're not borrowing from the bank, you're just getting the equipment. So that's, you can look at it from a, as a source of capital and it offsets, removes the need to borrow. So it's offsetting the need for borrowing as a, um, as a means of as a source for capital. Look at it from that end, sources of capital. You don't need the money to buy, you just leave the leasing company buy the, to get to lease the company and renting it. No, 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 lease the equipment, sorry, not the equipment. What is the other one? Convenience. Did it say convenience? Yeah. I, you're young, of course, and bright and cheerful. Of course you are. If you're not young and bright and cheerful, when will you ever be? I'm going to say something which you know, but trust me, ask the old man. 
But I have a wonderful life. I'm so happy with what I have. But I'll tell you, the best years of a person's life, not only old age, I'll tell you it's old age too, what you're going through in school. Right now, you know, every day is a new day. New friends, new semester, new professors, new fashion, new, oh boy, new, 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 new. After you're out of school, well, you get a job and it's going to be pretty much the same for the next five years till you get a little promotion. Eight to five, eight to the same boss. You can hey, do this. I'm not saying it's bad after this, but most of us say, oh, you know, I know I, I was being a student. You get a professor, you become a PhD. You, I've spent more time on sitting on the desk where you're sitting now in the class than you've lived all your life. That's the only way you can get a PhD. So I know all that goes into the mind of a student at your age. I've been there, seen it, done it. Yeah, but this is a good time, but it's not a bad. The only time you say, oh my God, the paper is due tomorrow. I have not written yet anything, you know. The exam is going the final. This professor is so terrible. I hate him. Yeah, I know how it happens. I hate it. My professor, I learned later, learned about well, these are the people who I should cherish because they give me the knowledge that I'm still using. Okay. You're very fortunate. Consider yourself fortunate you're sitting and listening and learning. There are millions like you who would love to be sitting in that. And you're even more fortunate if you ever, and I may have said it, no, no harm. If I've said it again and again, no harm. If something good I said, I, I, I never regret. Oh, yeah, I said it. No, so what? Even in prayer, you know, we, we repeat God's greatness. You know, is there any harm? God knows he's great, but we still tell him, you're great, God. Is there any harm? No. So what I'm saying is, you're fortunate, take advantage. And you're very lucky if you find three or four good teachers in your, class, in, your in your life. Cherish them, be close to them. Get whatever they can give you. Get whatever you can get from them. They don't, not professors, teachers. Teachers are very high level of achievement. Very few can achieve that. Oh, professors, there are, I think I read that there were over a million of them running around in the United States. No, 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 no. Professor is a job. I never look at myself as doing a job. The day if I ever think I'm doing a job, what I'm doing now, I will quit the next minute. Believe me. Why else would I do this at this time in my life? If it's a job and laborious and a headache, no, I will say, believe me, I will quit the next minute. If I look at it as a job, no, 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 no. That's what a million people look at a job. To me, what I, I'm doing is not a job. It's my mission in life. It is my mission in life. Mission is not a job. Mission is a very high calling. Why else would I go two hours nonstop? Because I, I want to share whatever little I know. Get it from me. Take it from me. Benefit from me. That's a missionary zeal. I'm not trying to praise myself. Please don't forgive me. I'm a very humble soul, but I'm just trying to convey. Cherish the teacher who is it. Next to your parents, the next person after your parents are your, is your teacher. Remember that. I always say that. Let me digress a little bit. Three persons, this is my tip, philosophy in life. Three persons in your life will be most happy or the happiest when you will succeed. Three, I'm not, so what, Dr. Malik, only three? Yes, I'll tell you who are those three. You may not like it, you may say, no, I don't accept it. That's, I'm not saying you have to accept it. It's not your brothers and sisters. I've got eight brothers and one of nine sons, not nine children. I've got six brothers, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to add now five brothers and three sisters, total nine. Nothing wrong. They'll be happy when I succeed. But even the best brothers and sisters, what we have is God put it in what we call sibling rivalry. You have a Mercedes, I want a Jaguar. You have a Jaguar, I want Lexus. You know, you want a three bedroom house, I want a four. 
nothing wrong. That is human nature. You're not saying anything bad about your brothers. Nothing wrong. Friends, same thing. You know, you have this, this nice house in this neighborhood. I want a bigger house and a better neighborhood. Nothing wrong. He said, well, who is left then? The three, who are the three? I can talk a lot more on this. Of course, the two you know are your parents because you're them. You're an extension of them. They see you, they see themselves in you. When you succeed, they feel they have succeeded. And you say, who is the third guy? The teacher. I'll tell you why. Professor, teacher. The day you become successful, I'll believe me, I'll be the happiest person you ever met in your life. So why would you be happy, Dr. Malik? I'll tell you why. I'm not a teacher. You see, I'm getting a little emotional here. No harm in becoming emotional. I can give you the story, but why did God put emotions in us? To hide them and not let them go? That's the biggest blunder people think. Men don't cry. What? I can cry at, at a moment's notice. What's wrong with men if they don't cry? Why do we have to? God put these qualities so we can sometimes show them. When you're happy, show. Sad, show. Oh no, this guy doesn't know, you know, he's so stressed, uh, cold and calm and doesn't, you know. He's like, a, what is he, like a rock of Gibraltar? Doesn't move by emotions? I would rather be by myself than be friend. I would never have a friend who can't show his emotions. Now, coming back to why the teacher, I go and get, get away philosophically a lot. I tend to bring myself back to what the finance is. Because the day you become super chairman of Exxon, why would I be happy? You know why? I said, ah, that Johnny there, you know, chairman, he was my student. He didn't know what I'm saying. I taught him everything. So what is it? I may not have taught you anything, but I like to believe I taught you everything. That's why you became a chairman. So why is that? I'm saying that? I mean, you say, well, no, Dr. Mali, you didn't do it. I like to believe that I did. So what is it? In your success, young man and young woman, I see my success. Will I be happy for my success? Yes. For now that you're successful, where do I see? I see I'm successful. Whatever you are, because of me. Maybe you're not, but that's what I would like to believe. So I will be happy, of course, for myself at least. There's a second reason. A teacher is in not competition with you. Why not? Young men, young women, your son is rising. You're 20, 22 year old. You have the whole life in front of you. May you succeed in life. May you be happy. Your son is rising. What about the old man like me? My son is setting. In many cases, is already set. Is there a competition? No. Your life is in front. My life is behind. There is no competition. So I can't be jealous of anybody if I'm he's not in competition with me. I can only be happy if I have a big heart. Have a big heart, please. Have a big heart. It's not a Sunday school lecture, please. Don't take it as a my church here. I'm not a church lecturer, a mosque lecturer, or a synagogue. I'm just talking to common sense. But never mind, let's get back to why we're here. <laughs> I get carried away sometimes. And so let's talk about convenience. That's what I got carried into the story, but you, all of you are young. And so you haven't had the chance. You haven't probably bought a house, maybe one or two, probably not. So let me see when you borrow for the house as an example. And I've done it a few times. And the, the banker says, you know, come down on the April the 3rd and we'll close the, the borrowing. You know, that's the day they'll give you the check for the house. That's typical. Um, the subject is convenience. And, we, and say, bring your wife with you. So what have you to do with my wife? Because if I'm buying a house, or when it, everything in Texas half belongs to her automatically. 
I know in every country that is not the law. And here we, that is the law. So that's true then. Convenience. So I go to the bank on April 3rd, whatever date it says come down. And there's a stack this big, this one, of paper that I have to sign. Hundred of them, documents they call them. Have I seen them before? No. Now what? Never seen them. So he said, Dr. Malik, sign wherever it says a yellow, I put a cross and a yellow sign there and give it to your wife so she signs. So I, I do that, you know, I do the one, two, three, four. A hundred documents, I've never seen them before. They all start with legal gobbledygook, legal language. What does it say? Every document, every sentence says, here to after, whereas, here with, here to after. What language is that? What well, legal? Oh, that sounds important. Here with, henceforth. Do you tell your girlfriend here to after we're going to have dinner? Leave me. Say that she's going to go run away after three minutes. It's my boyfriend's gone nuts here. Hey, don't tell your wife if you're married. Where off are we going for the picnic? Say, this is her money gone. Cuckoo, get out of his life. But this is how legal documents are written. Nonsense. Take the way off out. They read perfectly, but that's important. They make them feel important. So the point here is, you have to sign 100 documents. You never read them before. Yet you're responsible. Once you sign, you're responsible. No, I'm going to say to the doctor, I didn't read it. Say, well, you're a professor. Why didn't you read it? Well, what's wrong with you, guy? You're a teacher? Get out of here. So that gets cumbersome, big problem. Reading a legal mumbo jumbo is not easy. Finally, convenience. What convenience? Go to the leasing company, you order a rig, one signature, one said no wife needed. You give it a signature document to him, he push the rig where you want it. You want it in the Whatever, Permian Basin, he'll, he'll ship it there. That's it, case closed. Why not I go lease rather than borrow to and buy the rig and do all this boring covenants nonsense. One more, if I may, boring. Let's say your rig was $10 million, it's a big one. You don't have any money, you want to what? go to the bank. Go to the bank. I've been a banker and I said, and I'm the banker. So you come to me and say, hey, Mr. Banker, I want to borrow $10 million. I say, hey, good. How much? $10 million, okay. The first question I'm going to ask is, how much of your money are you going to put yourself? Because the rule is, most businesses, you are expected to put 30, 40% yourself first. They never give you 100% what you need. You say, I need, and he said, what percent, what percent? And the, he said, my a bank policy is, and I'll say, we first want you to put 40% of the price of the rate. It's $10 million, you put $4 million. What do you say? Banker, I came to you because I don't have the money. And he says, that's why I don't give you the money. He said, what? Because have you ever been in any country, no matter which country you come from, that the banker sitting inside comes out to the poor people who are hopeless on the street, lying on the street, street, street and say, hey, poor man comes inside. I've got money for you. Tell me, I'll be the first getting a ticket to that country. Bank don't give money to people who do not have money. They want to give money only to the people that already have money. Strange that it is. Don't waste your time if you don't have money in your pocket to borrow from the bank. So now you say, Mr. Banker, I came because he said, no, don't waste your time and don't waste my time. Get out of here. Come if you have $4 million, then we'll talk. For the rest, we'll give you $6 million. With leasing, you don't need $4 million down payment. All you need is a signature 
and the company will own the rig, they'll put it over there, you become the lessee, they are the owner, the lessor, case closed, one signature, and you got the rig. They don't need the $4 million. That is called 100% financing. Only leasing can give you that, not banking or borrowing from the bank. So that banking, borrowing from the bank is out then. So these are all the benefits of, of, of leasing. I've given you, I don't know, how many do I have? Five on the board, that should be enough. So today, has, I think, has been a wholesome uh, lecture. I've carried you through a lot. As I said, this is a repeat that I lost last time completely from yesterday. So I'm going to have repeated it. I hope you get something out of it. Having said that, we'll catch you next time. Have a good day. Thank you.